Hi, for those that don't know me, my name is Reuben Barclay. I work with 4J's development tools. I live in Auckland, New Zealand and have two roles. One of which I'm a technical consultant for the, for, for the Asia Pacific region. So I'm part of a small team that looks after the Gennaro customers in Australia, New Zealand, Malaysia and Taiwan and Southeast Asia. My other role has the title developer relations manager. So I look after things like the worldwide developer conference, keep an eye on our community forums, during early access programs, you'll see my feature of the day article. There is also my Ask Ruben blog where I post where I post articles on a weekly basis. Any um, your first point of contact should always be via support channels, but I do keep an eye on those support channels and um, occasionally nudge our team with better answers or the correct answer, and um, I use those as source material for my Ask Ruben articles. I have a very good memory and I'm very good at recognizing patterns, so I'm quite good at identifying, or I, I believe I am, at identifying common issues. If I have a favorite topic, just tell me a little bit about myself. It is generic code, which I will talk about later in this presentation. So my story is that I was first exposed to Infinix in 1997. I worked for a company named Quanta Systems in Auckland, New Zealand, working on their Infinix 4GL application. If that name rings a bell with a few old timers, one of my colleagues there was a man by the name of Kerry Sainsbury, who was on the IIUG board, and who contributed to a lot of IIUG things, and I think he even put some chapters in some Infinix books. Like most New Zealanders, I spent some time overseas, and that included time in London at a company, Fullest Within Turner, where um, I looked, helped look after an ERP system and some bespoke Infinix applications they had at the time. I spent a lot of time Oh, I spent a lot of my time there on the other side of the fence, looking after this ERP system, and that has given me a good insight as to what it's like being an end user. Back to New Zealand to settle down, buy a house and raise a family, and it was back to Quanta, where I ended up in Kerry's old R&D role. During this time, we transformed our Infimix 4GL application to Gennaro. That application is still ongoing, it's still going, and I can walk into a number of stores and see the system I transformed to Gennaro in 2003, 2004, still chugging along, doing its thing. I only wish that I'd been paid a fraction of a cent for every time certain functions were executed. In 2008, I joined 4Js, have been there since helping companies transform their code to Gennaro and improve their use of Gennaro. 4Js story. 4Js was founded in 1992. The names come from our founders who all had names that began with J. Hence, 4Js, John George, John Claude, John Philippe, and Johan. One of their initial, initial motivations was that they did not like the fact that they had already had to rewrite their application multiple times from BASIC to COBOL to Infimix 4GL. And so they started looking at ways that the Infimix 4GL could operate with the new fads of the day, which at that time was the Windows desktop. They did not want to rewrite their business logic again. As part of 4Js, initial or early foundings, there are products with names such as Universal Compiler, Business Development Systems, or BDS. And then from 2003, the Gennaro product was launched. And here we are nearly 20 years later, Gennaro is still going strong. Gennaro allows you to take your Infimix 4GL application, keep your business logic intact, but run on different operating systems with different databases, with different front ends. So with, onto a desktop, web, onto mobile. Gennaro developers have not had to constantly rewrite their application multiple times over the last 20 years. They have been able to concentrate their coding activities on what is new in the world we operate in and their business logic. The 4J story includes partnerships with IBM. During that time, you might have heard of IBM Infimix Gennaro, which is where there was an OEM arrangement in place with IBM. During this time, there was improvement of the compatibility of our product with Infimix 4GL, as we had access to the Infimix 4GL QA tests. If you ask how compatible is Infimix 4GL code with Gennaro, our compiler and runners had to pass the same QA tests as Infimix 4GL did. So if you discover any incompatibility, you are doing something that these QA tests would not have uncovered. Last year, the big news is that we were acquired by Volaris Group. A concern that some prospects and customers had when looking at us to partner with was our ownership structure. That is much improved under the Volaris Group. The Volaris strategy is to buy, hold, and nurture. So we now have a better story to tell. The serious part of these two talks is, is this first one, 
transforming your, and it's titled, Transforming Your System from Infimix 4GL to Gennaro. The many options and first steps. Now the title is Transforming Your System from Infimix 4GL to Gennaro. The emphasis being on the word transform. I like to use the word transform and not migrate. These three sentences I found in definitions of transform and I think they relate better for the process of starting with an Infimix 4GL application and finishing with a Gennaro application. To change into another form without altering the value. To change an appearance of character. To change greatly the appearance or form of. All these are saying that your business application will have the same logic underneath, but will look different in its appearance and how people interact with it, either via screens or reports. And will also be... Um, different in how systems interact with it, so using web services to interface for other systems to interface with your Gennaro application. When transforming from Infimix 4GL to Gennaro, you can go as fast and slow as you like, and you can go in many different directions. The biggest mistake I see is developers trying to do two or more things at once. Like children in a candy store, they try and take one of everything. The problem they then encounter is then trying to work out why something is not working as expected. And because they've changed so many things, they find it difficult to pinpoint the change that is causing them grief. My advice is to do your transformations one step at a time. That forms the basis of this presentation, looking at some of these steps you can do. You start off by compiling and running your Infimix 4GL application using Gennaro and character mode. Get used to our documentation, the way we do things. Then there are things you can do to improve your application and development environment at this point. After that, the order does not matter. You can do many things. Do you want a GUI IDE with Gennaro Studio? Do you want to document your code base with our documentation generator? Do you want to produce formatted reports using Gennaro Report Writer? Do you want to produce a web service API to expose, or do you want to consume web services? Do you want to interact with another database? Do you want to use more modern syntax in the context of your 4GL application? And do you want to give your application a GUI or graphical user interface? I mentioned GUI interface last. That could be first. All of the above are independent of one another. Most developers that transformed to Gennaro, the initial main motivator was the GUI interface. For ISVs, they needed to look good in demonstrations so they could sell their product. For enterprise customers, I tend to find more importance is placed on interfacing via web services and producing better reports and operating on more modern systems. That's what's important to them rather than necessarily the GUI. At the start, we always get asked, how long is a Gennaro transformation? I hate to give an answer because initially there are a lot of unknowns. And my flippant answer, depending on my mood I'm in, is I might say, how long is a piece of string? And the answer to fit as to how long a piece of string is, is to cut it in half and add the two halves together. So one half of this unknown length of string is your inputs. Its length will change based on the quantity and quality of your existing system. How many lines of code? How many screen forms? What is the quality and consistency of your code base? Someone with code generators, pre-processor usage, generic code, will transform in less time than someone whose entire code base is handwritten. Someone with code standards, neat and tidy code base will transform better than someone whose code is an inconsistent mess. If you have testing facilities and systems placed so you can compile all and run daily build and smoke tests, you will transform faster than someone who doesn't. Believe me, we have seen all sorts of different development environments. The other half of my mythical piece of string, what do you want at the end of the transformation? Do you want nice GUI screens? Do you want nice GUI reports? Do you want a modern development environment? Do you want the user experience to change? Are you taking the opportunity to make changes to your system when, you, when you've got the hood up? What is your expected quality? We find that ISVs have a better quality expectation than enterprise customers. Similarly, ISVs tend to work to a release date where everything needs to be done by that release date. Enterprise customers can be more gradual and do a program at a time, fix issues as you go, do another program, that type of thing. First step I like to do is to compile and run your existing application using our tools. This gives you the chance to evaluate all the new syntax and features we have with your existing application. 
You need to build a development environment that has our environment variables, such as our root directory, FGLDIR, and incorporate that within path LD underscore library path as appropriate. We have our compilation commands FGL comp, FGL form, and our runner FGL run. So typically you need to modify your make file to use these instead of the Infamix 4GL equivalents. So that when you type make, make run, you're using our commands and not Infamix 4GL commands. Some things you'll need to review at this stage. I say the word review, it doesn't mean you need to change, but it's prudent to look at. First of all, review your C code. C extensions are handled as shared libraries, as indeed are database libraries. You do not need to build a runner. What we often find is that the C code can be replaced by Gennaro libraries, particularly file handling. Any C routines you have to read files, write files, can be replaced by Gennaro code. You can often eliminate the need for these C libraries and, re and remove the C compilation step from your build process and then your Gennaro application is truly portable. We also make use of something we call a database schema. Rather than hitting the database with every compile, you create what we call a schema file once from your development database and then every compilation reads from this file. You are then at a point where you have your, your existing Infamix for 4GL application compiling and running using a 4J's Gennaro compiler and runner within your existing character environment. This is what we call TUI mode, or text user interface. We have had customers pause at this point. They're happy, their system is running on a modern operating system, it is actively supported, and then they can slowly work out what they're going to do next. In terms of first steps, this is your first milestone. Get to this point where you can compile and run your application in TUI mode. The next step is to look around and evaluate. Now while you pause and look around is that Gennaro has been continuously developed for 20 years. We don't have a Wikipedia page, this is where I say feel free to write some independent articles so that we can, but if we did, our release history page or section on a Wikipedia page would look something like this. As shown by the left hand two columns, every one to two years we have a new release. There is 20 years of continuous R&D development that has gone into our product. When you sit down and look, that is a lot of man years of, e man years of effort available to you. You can see the result of that effort by looking in our documentation. Now I would encourage you to get familiar with our documentation early on, and each set of documentation has, has a section called the new features. Here you can read what we've added to the product over the 20 years. So not just what was released in 4.00, our last release, but going all the way back to versions 1.20 from 20 years ago. I would suggest having a read and see the volume of features and functionality that we have added. Even for experienced developers, I encourage them to go back and read these sections over and over again, just in case there's any new functionality that they might have missed. The other thing to note about um, our product is that each product has its own set of documentation. This documentation is available online, or you can get it downloaded as zipped HTML and PDF. And it's also available within Gennaro Studio. The documentation is the same in all those destinations, but the search algorithms will differ based on the tool. One of the first things I do in on-site is note how someone uses our documentation. If they have it bookmarked and can search and find pages quickly, that is a good sign. If they don't have the documentation bookmarked, or they struggle to open and find a section, that tells me a lot. Okay, so we're at the point where you have your application compiled into Gennaro and running in text user interface mode. You know how to read our documentation. You've hopefully purchased some Gennaro license and are a fully fledged customer, or you have some evaluation licenses to, ev to evaluate your product. At this point, you have accessed everything. We have historically not charged extra for using additional products if you're a Gennaro customer that has paid your maintenance. However, before I talk about Gennaro Web Services, Gennaro Studio, Gennaro Report Writer, GUI interfaces, etc., you can make improvements to your code base and you can make improvements to your development environment. Even using a TUI application, you can take advantage of these code improvements. The first simple one I like to point out is string and dynamic array. With char and array variables, historically you specified a maximum length. 
This is the amount of memory that would get allocated. Chances are you would not use the full amount or even come close most of the time, but would have chosen some large arbitrary number. What you can do is use string and dynamic array that allocate memory as required. My rule of thumb is that when you see char or array defined with a length, is there some rationale to that length? For an array, a good rationale might be 12 for the number of months in a year. But if you see large numbers such as 1,000, 5,000, you know that typically there is no rationale to this large number apart from it being large. These chart and array variables are prime candidates to be coded as string and dynamic arrays. You, can you typically can reduce the amount of code when you do this, as you don't have to enforce the arbitrary maximum length, and you also find that you'll reduce runtime errors when nothing has been put into your code to protect this arbitrary maximum length. You can also improve the speed of your programs by reducing what is passed between functions to be a pointer instead of an actual value. Dynamic arrays are passed by reference. The in-out keyword can be used to indicate that a record is passed by reference. String buffer is a class designed for efficient manipulation of strings. Rather than passing large strings around, pass a reference to a string uh, to a string buffer around. That is, rather than pushing and popping a large chart or string onto the stack, push and pop a pointer onto the stack instead. Also available are methods such as these, so um, which I've listed for sorting and ser searching through arrays. These will outperform any 4GL code attempting to do the same. Globals are prone to causing errors because they are compiled into the 4GL. If you change the global files, you have to have recompiled all usages of that global file. If you did not use a globals file, then you have to ensure that any global variables defined are the same in every 4GL. We introduced import FGL, which I'll talk about later, but you can use this to ensure that any application variables are defined the same across your application. What you can also do is define complex structures centrally using type, thus, thus ensuring that what you pass to and from functions is of the same structure. When defining a function, you can explicitly state what it is expected to return. This allows you to capture at compile time cases where it returns something unexpected. These type of initiatives reduce the amount of runtime errors and means you'll capture sloppy code at compile time, not at runtime. There are also coding improvements that make your sources easy to read because there's more chance that all the code the developer is interested in is close together on the one screen. Though not having to scroll to the top to look up variable definitions, the variable can be defined where it is first used. Instead of using three lines, you're using one line instead. We have also added syntax that a developer is likely to have seen in other languages. This makes it easier for developers to transition to Gennaro as they have seen concepts they have seen in other languages and they are able to use them straight away. Even something like constant, which was added in Gennaro 1.1. Another example is the use of try and catch to handle exceptions. The dot notation is used with our concept of packages, classes, and methods. It's familiar to programmers coming from non-4GL environments. Incorporating this modern syntax into a code base helps the new developer's mindset when they first encounter Gennaro code, and um, you'll find your developers will be more productive. The dot notation is used in the libraries we have added to extend the functionality of the, long, of the language. There are many libraries, but they include working with files and pipes and sockets with base.channel, working with file systems using os.path, advanced maths with util.math, manipulating strings with base.stringbuffer, splitting strings with base.stringtokenizer, um, libraries for JSON and XML, and in our latest release, we've even added, we've finally added regular expressions using the util.regexept class. You can extend your Genaro application by importing your own C libraries. The use of this is rare. Some people are comfortable with C and do, and do not need to consider portability and having to recompile, so they're still quite comfortable using these C libraries. Normally, as part of that first step, you've removed the need for custom C libraries by using our libraries 
that do the functionality that what you had to hand write in C before. What is more popular is using import Java to import Java libraries. One of the more popular is using the Apache POI libraries to read and write Excel and Word files. So just as a Gennaro developer would use these libraries to create and interact with Word and Excel, so can a Gennaro developer. Rule of thumb, as long as there's no GUI in the Java library, anything a Gennaro developer can do, a Gennaro pro developer can probably do as well. 4GL programs have historically been created by linking compiled modules together. You can continue to do that. What you can also do now is remove the linking process and move to a state whereby the external 4GL modules are for reference from within a 4GL file via the use of import FGL. So rather than expecting the link process to link modules together, you can explicitly reference them by the use of the import 4GL line at the top and then um, use that function. Then you have the public functions, types and methods that are in that library available to you in this current 4GL code. So this first option or first demo I'm going to show is um, using an example from our GitHub repository and it's um, the GitHub repository for JS Gennaro and the example is FGL underscore Apache underscore POI. And if I run this, pro this um, program, it's got a number of test programs to interact, interact with Excel and Word. I'm going to run the pivot test. So if I run that code, it's going away. And what that's doing is it's using um, import Java to interact with some Java libraries that are creating my um, spreadsheet. And then when I open my spreadsheet, it's created a spreadsheet, it's dumped some data to the spreadsheet, and then it's also generated a pivot table. So if we go back and look at the code for this, so inside FGL underscore Excel underscore pivot, there I've got an import FGL, FGL underscore Excel, and so that's importing my Excel library that I wrote. And you can see there's lots of code in there that's saying call that module with the particular um, function, so creating a worksheet, workbook, creating a worksheet, and then going down and adding data to the report. Well, that was the headings, adding data to the report in that loop, and then create, using these methods to create a pivot table. And if we look inside under FGL underscore Excel.4GL, we'll see that that's using um, import Java to import a range of Java libraries that is doing all the Excel work for us. So that's just something nice and quite powerful, I think, that's showing just what you can do with Excel um, by, by using import FGL and import Java to create programs. Localization or internationalization. Using Gennaro, you can internationalize your application so that it can run in different languages. Have an English, French, German, Italian, Spanish, Chinese, etc. version of your application by replacing strings with tokens in your code base. And then at runtime, have these tokens replaced with the appropriate text in the desired language. For compiling code and running code, there are many new options. So FGL comp, FGL form, FGL run have many new options. These might include minus M to write errors to stand it out instead of producing error files, using dash dash format to beautify your code, minus W to output some warnings. The compiler also has a built-in preprocessor that can be used to transform sources before compilation. With the runner, there are many additional options that are useful for the developer and your development environment. Code coverage to see what lines of codes have been executed by your program, or more importantly, what lines of codes are not being executed and tested. The profiler to run a program and analyze where the time is spent by that program. If FGL SQL debug to get a trace of the SQL instructions carried out by the program. And trace can tell you the program flow of what programs, what functions are called, and with what arguments. The Gennaro compiler also has the facility to generate documentation from your source code. The technique requires inserting comments in a structured fashion in your source code, and then running fglcomp-build-doc, 
and it will generate some HTML documentation. We've had customers where this is their first step in their Gennaro transformation, so that they know what they have within their existing code base. The last entry I'll mention here is what has happened with the database instruction. It's still there, but it's always had two uses. What we have done is added two keywords that can be used to separate each of those two uses. Schema tells us what database schema has been used to resolve all your like table.column, like table.asterisk definitions. The key thing to note with schema is that you create what we call a database schema file once, and then when a file is compiled, it reads the schema file to find out this information. So at compile time, the compiler is not continuously hitting your database. That information is extracted from the database as a separate process and then used by all your developers. Connect is used to connect to a database and it allows multiple con database connections at a time, which the existing database command did not. We've also added the concept of indirect specification, which if used properly, means you do not need to recompile your application to point at a different database, test or live, etc. The physical location of the database can be held in a configuration file, which we call FGL profile. The, OD the ODI layer also exists for you to use alternate database. In this audience, I'll assume we're all tied to Infomix, but if there's another database in your mix, your generic application can connect to it, and your generic application can connect to, to, multiple, to, to your Infomix database and another database at the same time. So there's a bit of potential improvement in your code base and development environment on how you connect to databases. Now I just want to pause here. Note that I've not talked about GUI or our other products. There is 20 plus years of continuous development to the base product and to the compilation and the running of the base product. Even if you stay on text user interface mode, there is a lot of additional tools in your toolbox that are now available to you. If you're coming across some Infomix 4GL, there is a lot of catching up, just in the volume of what is available. I would suggest you work closely with your Gennaro support office. Don't hide in your office. Build the new look to incorporate the new functionality into your development environment and into your application. Yeah, so review your existing code and see where you can make, improve, exist, make improvements by tinkering here and tinkering there. Make room for this new syntax within your coding standards. Now I want to move on and look at our various products. In terms of steps, the order is up to you. Do what is important to your organization. To emphasize that Gennaro is more than just GUI, I will do GUI last. First up, I will talk about Gennaro Web Services. You have functionality in your 4GL application that you may wish to expose to other systems. The modern way of doing this is via Web Services. Gennaro Web Services allow you to consume and expose web services. You will hear terms such as SOAP and RESTful. We cater for both. We have libraries that exist for, that allow you to work with both JSON and XML. To expose a function as a web service, you'll create a program that has that function that you want to expose. You add WS attributes to the function and its parameters that detail how that function will be exposed. You will need to review your functions for its stateless properties. You do not want any modular or global variables that will be preserved each time the function is called. But you will want to prepare database cursors so that the function operates quickly. Your web service cannot have any UI code. This is one of the ones where the quality of your code can impact how long it takes to do something. If you've already separated UI and business logic, then this step is likely already done for you. When it comes to host and production, you'll need to use the generic application server. To consume a web service, at a high level, you can generate code using FGL WSDL or FGL RESTful. These gen can generate 4GL code from a web service definition. Your, your, your code then becomes import FGL generated code, call the generated code dot web service function, I, a one line of code a call plus some error handling. 
if it is not possible to generate, then you may need to code this library by hand. But hopefully the web service you are calling conforms to standards enough so that our generators, FGLWSTL and FGL REST 4, can work. Unfortunately, not all web services providers adhere to all standards. For a first step with web services, take a simple function and add some web service attributes. So you can see here this function has attributes wsparam alongside each parameter, and then for the function definition, wsget, wspath. Next, create a parent program to manage the web service. So you can see there's my little parent process, and the important line of code there is register red service to say, this is the module where our function is in. And then you can run that program. And see how you can call that web service via curl or by typing a URL into a browser and getting the response. You are now making a web service call to your Gennaro function. If you can get this far for one simple function, hopefully you can recognize that any function can potentially be exposed. What will be different will be the name of the function, the name and number of parameters. You will investigate and use different WS attributes. You will probably add in some more error handling to what I've shown thus far. Finally, you will expose the web service via Gennaro application server and a production level web server. But hopefully you recognize that this is the first step to expose a web service. Now what about consuming a web service? Let's take the web service we have just generated. You can study the definition by appending question mark openapi.json to the end of the URL. You can generate a file from this definition using FGL RESTful. You can then import and call this web service. So the first step of the Gennaro web services, evaluate using a simple function. Expose it as a web service. Note how you can consume it. Generate code to consume it as a web service. And then review what web service attributes are available and you might want to incorporate within your web services. For functions you want to expose, review and look at how stateless they are. Make sure there's no user interface and also um, no code based on the owner of the process. Um, on this slide, I've just attached some useful documentation links for use of web services. You might have noticed on other slides, I've tried to incorporate links where we um, where appropriate, but here for web services, I've just got them all at the end because I don't think they fitted neatly onto the other pages. So of web services from a generic application. So here I've got a function. Um, it's called add and I've got underscore pram because I'm for a few different programs showing the different methods. But um, add underscore ws pram. So you notice the function has some attributes that say that are applicable to the function. So here we're saying we're doing a get and the URL is going to include add underscore ws pram and include the parameters being passed as part of the URL. Other options being part of queries, it's been part of the query or cookies or um, what's the fourth one? Header, header elements. But um, so that's my simple little test function, and then I have that being referenced from my parent program. So it's importing FGL, calculator server, and then starting a web service engine. So if I start that running, that's just running silently in the background, and then I can come along and type something like that. That is my test, and that's going to go away call that web program as a web service and you see it's return value of three. So just to prove that it's not hard coded, change the value and now you can see this return a value of six. So you can test your web service through tools such as curl or you can even, um, depend if the output's good, put it into a into the type of URL into your browser and you can see the number coming back. So that's how you're basically exposing this function File your web service. From that, you can also um, look at the. Our code will manage the publishing of the definition for you. So if I now type this URL in, then I'm getting my definition of the web service. And then I can use FGL RESTful to generate some source. And I've already done that, and that would have generated. Um, 
this file here. Yep. So that's generated a file. So you don't need to worry about coding what you see in here. That's all the web service code be generated for you. You just need to know that you can come along and call it by importing it and then um, calling the appropriate function. So that's a quick little demo of um, web services for you. Next, I want to look at reporting and using Gennaro Report Writer. Something to note when first looking at Gennaro Report Writer, first is that the documentation, the documentation is found within the Gennaro Studio documentation. Currently, we don't have a separate book for the Gennaro Report Writer. It's um, historically been bundled in with the Studio documentation. That may change in the future. There is also a good demo in the Tutorials and Samples tab as part of Gennaro Studio. You will need to use Gennaro Studio to edit report design documents or 4RP files. Um, so even if you don't use Gennaro Studio, you will find it happy for your senior developer to have Gennaro Studio there so you can run the demos and your report designers will need to use the Gennaro Studio to design your Gennaro Report Writer um, design document files. First, first up, GRW has a concept called the compatibility report. This is where it takes the ASCII report produced by a normal report statement and passes it through the Gennaro report engine. This allows you to output your existing reports in formats such as PDF with minimal change. It is also a good way to learn the various FGL underscore report functions that can configure things like the type of report, file name, etc. The coding for compatibility mode is that the start report line is modified so it says start report and then report name to XML handler and then the name of, of a variable. This variable is of type om.saxdocument handler, which is basically something you use when interpreting XML. And there will be a few lines of FGL report function calls that configure the report. The things to note is that the argument for FGL report load current settings is null. This indicates that there is no report design document, but to use compatibility mode. The various FGL underscore report functions configure the output. In this example, the key one being FGL underscore report underscore select device, taking, which is taking PDF as the argument to indicate that the generated report should be PDF. The lines you can see here are enough to take your existing 4GL report and output it as PDF. Now the compatibility report just has the one monospaced font and font size. It has no colour, images, graphics, etc. To get all these um, bells and whistles, you need to unlock the full power of Gennaro Report Writer. To use the full power of GRW, the FGL underscore report underscore load current settings line will need to take as, as an argument a report design document or 4RP. The report instruction is now only responsible for gathering data. There is no need for any layout information, that is, no print column, no page header, no skipped lines, etc. Just gather up the report information, group it appropriately, groups are still important and print the information that is unique to each group. To design a report design document, first we will need to get a description of what information is being output by the report statement. The dash dash bold minus RDD argument for FGL comp does this for us and outputs a .rdd or report data schema file that has a description of what the report outputs. This file is then used in the report designer. The report designer is a GUI tool where you design and lay out the report. You can drag elements from the report design document and place them in your, I mean the report design data view and place them in your report. You can drag empty widgets from the toolbox and place them in your report as well. Each element has properties which you then edit. So you do all that and build up your 4RP or report design document. When working with Gennaro Report Writer, it is important to understand the architecture. There are three parties, the designer, the engine, and the viewer. All three can be on different machines, 
So at any time you'll ask, you need to ask yourself, hey, is a particular font available in each of these machines? Is an image available on the appropriate machine? You should note that the GRE has two inputs, the designer report and an XML data stream, the output of the report statement that has been created for the start report to XML. From these two imports, the Genaro Report Engine then produces the formatted report, PDF, HTML, SVG. Another important concept to note is the um, XML data stream that's coming across from your 4GL program into your report engine. This has two neat things. One, you can save it at this point in time, so you only hit the database once to generate the data for many different reports. The second is that this then leads into the streaming concept, which, is unique, which I believe is unique to Genaro Report Writer where when it is output, it produces one page at a time and then works on to the next page. So that helps with the memory consumption, particularly for large reports, and it also means that when you start to print a report, you can find page one coming out on your printer while it's still figuring out how to do page two, etc. So first steps with Gennaro Report Writer. Ideally, you'd have Gennaro Studio in place so you could look at the tutorials and samples and the demo reports. Study and note the various examples and keep referring to them as an ongoing reference. With a program with one of your existing reports, add the five or so lines of code at the top to output one of your existing reports as PDF using compatibility mode. Explore the different FGL underscore report functions available. Next you'll want to try creating a report design document. Modify the report statement just to be responsible for generating data. Build a .rdd and then design a report design document around it, or using it. On your first report, go slowly. Don't try and do too much in your first report. Just to pick one element from each print, add, perhaps add a page header inside your design document, and then slowly add more um, elements. When implementing GRW, decide what reports you want to use GRW for. You'll probably find that public facing reports have a higher priority then internal financial reports, for example. You should look for patterns in your reports because you'll most likely find reports fit into um, a small number of design patterns. Your invoices will look like your purchase orders. Your financial reports will all look the same. So even if you think you have many reports to create, they will likely all be variations on a handful of basic patterns of order of Genaro Report Writer. So within Genaro Studio, I'm going to go to Tutorials and Samples and then click on Reports. And that's um, got my order reports demo program. So I'm first going to start off with um, a compatibility mode. And if I run that demo, hopefully what it's going to produce is just a fairly simple looking report. So I do it to, and I think I did it to Oh, there, I did, I did it to PDF. So um, it's output to PDF, and you can see it's a fairly simple looking report. So that's just taking your existing report statement and output and produced a PDF for you. So if we look at the report statement, um, Kurt structure, find the report. It's here somewhere, there it is. Report all orders. So it's got the page header before group and on every row. And in the PDF, it's just Faith, faithfully followed that structure to produce your compatibility report. So that's a quick way of producing um, reports, your existing reports out to PDF. What you really want to get into is using um, GUI reports. So if I click on the order report example, what I can now do is I'll run that, and that produce, gives us an option. So this the demo program has a list of many different reports. The typical one we do is start as order report. And then if I preview that, it chugs away. And eventually it outputs a nice looking GUI report. So you can now see we've got different fonts, bold, color, images, barcodes, all sorts of cool things you expect to see in a report. And so the and report writer is based on using um, the report design document. So the, that was the design for the report. 
So um, we can see that this report's got many elements in it, and each of them has various, each of those report objects has properties that you can then go in and change. So in that instance, the color, and designing the report, you're dragging reports either from the data view across to the report, or you're bringing across the empty elements across to your reports. So that's a quick little peek at Genaro Report Writer. Um, as I said, you probably do compatibility reports, and then um, you move into graphical reports after that. Genaro Studio is our GUI IDE. Your development environment does not have to consist of using VI in a terminal emulator. To first look at Genaro Studio, one solution I have is to explore using the Genaro test drive. Explore using this on your PC in a separate area away from your existing env environment. This has um, some sample programs in the tutorials and sample tabs. So it's just something like Hello World or one of the other programs. But get it, or create your own little program. That'd be even better. But get in there and explore the code editor, explore the form designer, explore the projects view, generic configuration reference, generic configuration management, preferences, and the debugger. The code editor will allow you to improve your developers' productivities. You get things like code completion, real-time syntax checking, um, the symbol definitions and code structure view give you information about functions. Uh, and as well as editing 4GL, you can also use the um, code editor to edit, edit XML. It also has a beautifier option, so if you edit, format, and net, and that will beautify and tidy up your code. There is a form designer where you can use forms using a near WYSIWYG design editor. This is not mandatory, and you can still edit .per files in your code editor. I would say that the majority of customers still use .per rather than going down the WYSIWYG path with the form designer, just because they're more comfortable with .per um, and don't, don't necessarily see the additional benefits of using a WYSIWYG form designer. I'm an old school, I, to be honest, I still tend to use .per as well. The projects view shows how files are organized within your project. So what files belong to which Genaro application? which library, which files belong to which library, and which, and if you're still using libraries, which programs use the various libraries. Think of it as like being the equivalent of a make file in some way. The build rules also control how files are compiled or executed. So when we say compile a file, is FGL comp file name executed, or are there a few additional scripts or tools run at that time? The Genaro configuration management window contains the information needed to run Genaro commands. What Genaro installation is installed? What environment variables are set? And then when you come to run your program, what front end is it going to use? So again, this is where you put in your configuration so that when you press the green triangle to execute a command, what is actually going to be executed? Within the preferences, I'd suggest you go and explore and just look at what you can do there to customize your um, design, your development environment to suit your preferences. The other main benefit is with, with Genaro Studio is being able to use the graphical debugger. So in your initial evaluations, get in there, take your little test program and run the debugger, knowing how you can step through and easily see the variables that are displayed the value of each variable being displayed in the bottom panel. Then you need to consider how to fit Genaro Studio around your development environment. You need to decide whether you're going to have a local or a remote configuration. So that's where you might be using Genaro Studio. A remote configuration might be where you're using Genaro Studio on your Windows PC, but you're still doing the compilation and running on your Linux backend server. So that requires a bit of configuration and um, setup. You probably need to consider how you're going to um, manage your four PWs for your existing sources. So the four PW is the main project file. Do you have one big global four PW, or go smaller and have one four PW per application, or do you operate somewhere in the middle? Um, you need to mould Genaro Studio to fit your development environment. So that's where you get in and tinker with build rules, Genaro configuration management 
preferences, user actions, file space new, and templates. All things that you can do in there to change the way Studio operates to fit your development environment better. So the first step of the Genaro Studio is explore. Get, get it going and create and run some programs, even if it's just on your local PC and not attached to the rest of your um, development environment. And pay particular attention to how you edit files, you compile and run applications, and use the debugger. You should then consider how to fit Genaro Studio into your development environment. You can configure Studio to meet your needs, but the one piece of advice I would give is don't be totally fixated on the way you do things. Be prepared to change the way you do things to meet Gennaro Studio. It's, I quite often find customers get fixated on one thing and um, it seems silly to miss out on a number of the other benefits in Gennaro Studio because you're not prepared to um, be flexible in a certain area. So that, that's my advice there. It's just, as, as well as adapting Studio to meet your needs, be prepared to meet, to change your, to, development environment so that you can work with Gennaro Studio better. Demo using Gennaro Studio. Um, I won't show too much because I'm using it in all, all my other demos, but this little play example, do something like code completion. So I've got a record, I've got one, two, three. So if I said let record, then I'm getting code completion to help me code that quickly. You also get um, real-time syntax checking. So Type in some nonsense, and there I'm getting a error popping up at the there, and down in the documentation here is document errors tab. I'm getting that error displayed as well, and if I double click on it, then it takes me to that appropriate place in the code. So that's your real time syntax checking. You're getting code structure, so you're getting information about reports. So if I was to say display add, at that point it's telling me a little bit about what's expected in that function. And also, if you look over on the right-hand side, I can also see information about that function. So the accent that is taking two parameters and returning an integer. And we can then um, also use the debugger. So I've put a breakpoint on that line. And now if I um, debug and oops, choose the right program to debug first. What's that other program I was working on? Okay, um, debug. So here I've, um, and then I can um, step into, and then I can see the various parameters that are in there. And as I loop through, um, loop through, you can see that I's incrementing as I go. So that's a quick little look at the debugger. So you can see, you can be able to see the variables. Um, you can actually turn them on and off if these variables you're not interested in and just basically run through your code. So that's Genaro Studio. It's an IDE. It's very mature. Um, it enables you to edit, compile, and run your Genaro applications. It also enables you to um, file the configuration, run in different various options. So running through the desktop or running through web, etc. And you can configure what options are available there. Um, preferences, you can come through and turn things on and off. I think that's one thing I didn't show was the beautifier, so I'm going to mess this code up a bit. And now if I go edit, format and indent, it's putting it back and keeping my code neat and tidy. So um, Genaro Studio, yeah, so preferences, you can get in there and change many things. Manage your various configurations. So my desktop mode, I'm using GDC, I'm using FGL version 4.0101. I'm going into web, then I'm using gas instead of display client, etc. And if I'm running some of my older versions, then yeah, it's running FGL 320 and GDC 320. So it's all managed by my configurations. And the other element there is um, build rules. So if I go to edit build rules, we can see the steps that are occurring when you compile a file. So, um, so when you compile a file, it's to an FGL comp program, then move move the 42M to the target directory, etc. So you can customize your develop or mold 
to know a studio around your development environment by changing your build rules, changing your configuration. And you can also do things like um, putting in additional toolbar buttons, top menus to do your own sort of actions. So rather than having to go out to a different window, you can come along here and just add the action within Gennaro Studio. So if I just look at the definition for that, I forgot I had that one there, sample. Yes, yeah, so it's doing a sample user action. So I've got little user actions to help me open, go to certain directories quicker. Where did I put them? I forget where I put them, but I can go into, there I, I can go in them there and open up certain directories nice and quick. So I've customised Studio a little bit to help me out there. Also, um, or one other area of customization is using templates. So if I go File New, you can customize what appears here. And you can also use things like templates. So for my example, input programs nice and quick. I've customized that to generate that program nice and quick. So, so Studio, very powerful, lots of options available to you. I'm not going to do it justice doing it doing a three minute demonstration, but um, yeah, there's, there's a lot there within Genaro Studio. Next up, Genaro Application Server, or GAS. GAS is the tool we use to maintain and manage communication between the front end and the Genaro runtime. It manages the start of a program, the ongoing communication, and any interactions between the front end and the runtime server, such as uploading, downloading files, servicing images, etc. GAS does not have to be used for, for TUI applications, it is not needed. And when using GDC, you can continue to use what we call direct connection. You will need to use GAS when you have web services and when you're running applications in a web browser. To ensure that GAS is configured and installed correctly, the test you do is that after installation, run the demos.html web page. From that page, you can then run out demo programs that are available with inside your Gennaro installation. GAS configuration is based around .xcf files. One of the main responsibility of GAS is that when a web program or web service program is started, the following needs to happen. Somewhere, you're gonna CD to a directory. You're going to set and export environment variables to particular values, and then you're going to execute FGL run program and a list of arguments. You need to understand .xcf enough so that you, to start and run your web service programs and your programs that you want to run in your web browsers. In terms of application changes, one thing you need to be aware of is now who is the process owner of the FGL run process? You may need to alter your code to reflect the fact that the person running the program has not logged into the runtime system that you're running on. I values environment variables such as home will be different than what you expect. So if you have any code that's dependent on that, you will need to review that. With GAS, you should understand the architecture or have a good idea of the architecture. You should have an understanding of what the roles and responsibilities of the proxy and dispatcher are. That's important when you come to log, log files because each of those will produce a different log file. You should also be aware or understand that a production level web, service, web server will be needed for production in front of GAS. This is where things like authentication, load balancing and HTTPS will take place. We rely on the web server to do that. We don't have that functionality built into the um, GAS product. So first steps with GAS, there's your installation tests. Make sure you can run the demo web page and the Gennaro demo programs. Then I suggest you look at how to amend your .xcf file to run your own Gennaro programs and have them and um, as an asset test run your Gennaro applications in a web browser. Be prepared to amend your code base if you're dependent on the process owner. Um, application server, so use this URL. You would normally use 6394 as the default, but I've used that for another version, so 6395 is what I'm going to change it to. And that's the demo page from the Genaro application server. So that's telling us that the Genaro application server is running, 
and it's configured enough to get that far. And if I click Gennaro Demos, then we can even start the Gennaro application running. And this is just running our normal, our normal demos inside a, um, inside a browser. So in terms of uh, what GAS has done, I go into PS and um, find HTTP dispatch. So that's this is the name of the process that GAS is running. So process 02413. I'll just find the, there's probably a smarter way of doing this. So there's my UA proxy process, and I'll use the last one, 83039. Yep. So within GAS and the architecture, we've got our dispatcher, which in turn started a proxy process, UA proxy, which in turn has started um, an FGL run process, so running our demo program. So what GAS is doing is it's taking that URL that's been typed in to start the program, which in effect is now this URL, you can see there. And it's saying, okay, I need to CD to a directory, set an environment, and run this program. So that's what GAS is doing for you. And then it's, it's starting that program, and then it's managing the communication between what I'm doing here, and in, in this instance, the browser, but it could have been a web service, or a Gennaro desktop client, and our runtime server. So hopefully that's giving you a little insight as to what GAS is doing there. Now let's talk GUI. If you've decided to transform your GUI, let's look at the steps you need to walk through. The power of our architecture is via the dynamic user interface, the AUI tree and the front end view protocol. This all happens behind the scenes, but it is helpful to have a little bit of um, knowledge of just what's occurring there. Now you'll hear us refer to the GDC or Gennaro desktop client. This is an executable that sits on the front end. That renders this AUI tree, or the abstract user interface tree, sorry I didn't get that definition earlier, and so it renders the AUI tree and it returns the, whatever the user does, it returns that action back to the runtime system. Now the key thing to note with GDC is there are two typical modes of how you're running it. When you're starting, when you're developing, you're at the command prompt and you type FGL run program, so at that point, the GDC is listing on a port. The FGL run communicates with the GDC via the FGL server environment variable and starts displaying your program. When you get to production, your users aren't going to type in a command at the command prompt. What they're going to do is, with the GDC on the desktop, they're probably going to double click on the desktop, which initiates a connection back to the runtime system via the GDC, and then using either direct connection, logs onto the server, and executes your commands to start the Gennaro application, or if you're using HTTP, it goes through the, via the Gennaro application server. The first thing you should be aware of with GUI is we have this thing called traditional mode. Now this is very handy to ease migration, because what it does is it renders the unchanged Infimix 4GL screens in a GUI desktop window or browser. You, the user can then use the mouse to click buttons in addition to hitting the accelerator keys, and they can use, mouse, use the mouse to move the cursor around. Traditional mode is useful for slow transformations, particularly amongst enterprise customers. You transform or do the GUI transformation of your important programs first, but your less imp important programs, you take a little longer and just um, transform them slowly over time when you have spare time, perhaps do one at a time, maybe targeting one a day, a couple of weeks, etc. So if you have 100 programs, 1,000 forms, etc., get your important programs working in a fully fledged GUI, and perhaps dedicate enough resource to transform the rest of the balance slowly using traditional mode. So you have those programs you haven't converted using traditional mode, but still appearing in the GDC desktop window or the browser window. When it comes to transforming your Gennaro forms and using graphical mode rendering, what you're going to be doing is replacing screen with layout. And then once you've got the layout command or syntax at the top, there's a whole lot of new syntax available to you to arrange your forms using GUI containers and widgets. 
So what you typically end up doing is you assign widgets to fields. So you might start with a field line in your dot per fo1 equals formula only dot field. And then you add a widget at the beginning. So in this case, I've added button edit. And then you add various attributes that are applicable for that widget at the end. So in this case, I've added action equals zoom. So that will now render a button edit on the form. And if the user clicks on the button in the button edit, the zoom action will be triggered. You then arrange the fields on your form using containers. So this is where you add additional keywords to say this is how the form or the widgets within this um, container are arranged. So in this example, I've got a group box surrounding a table. Another concept you have when you go to GUI is the concept of presentation, presentation styles. So you centralize the appearance of your application via presentation style. What this means is that you typically remove a lot of attributes from your Forge old code base. So those display attributes, red or open window attributes, bold, dim, etc. Those can hopefully all be removed from your code and you can centralize the appearance with presentation styles. The advantage being with centralized presentation styles is that you can make a change in one place and have that be reflected throughout your application. As opposed to the old Infamix 4GL technique where you might have said attributes red, if you decide you wanted to change that color, you had to find every single attribute's red and change it to attributes yellow or whatever you're trying to change it to. So um, yeah, centralize using presenta file presentation styles. With 4.00, we standardized on what we called universal rendering. This gave you a consistent user interface on all devices. So desktop, web, mobile iOS, mobile Android. These all now used web technologies rather than native widgets, so that we got the same rendering across all our devices. Universal rendering had this concept of customization. So that's where we give you the sources for the front end rendering, and you can customize this. So you might use that to apply your corporate look and feel, or um, so like, like that red example there, or um, add a header and footer across every Gennaro form. It also enabled you to add GUI options that perhaps weren't available in our standard code base. So in that image on the right, being able to do rounded images like you see. You could achieve that via customization. Also within 4.00, we added new syntax to make forms responsive for different sizes. So in that particular screenshot, um, an HBox with a left and right container, if there wasn't enough room to display both, it would display one or the other, and you'd use the, um, you swipe between them on a mobile device or click a little button on a desktop device. I should also mention web components. So these are external graphical components that can be incorporated within your Gennaro forms. And this is what you typically use for things like charts and graphs, maps, video, um, and infographics. FGL SVG Canvas is a web component we supply, which enables you to create your own SVG image inside a web component. So then maybe you create your own infographics or create your own graphs and charts. There are four areas of 4GL coding you should be aware of when transforming to GUI. The UI package, this is where you use methods from the UI package where you can change dialog dialogue and window and form properties at runtime. The two key examples here are ui.dialog.setActionActive, which enables you to enable or disable an action, and ui.form.setFieldHidden, which enables you to hide or show a field. You use these methods to reduce duplication of 4GL code, because in the past with Infamix 4GL, you may have had two or more forms that were slightly different, or two or more dialogue statements that were slightly different, just because there was some configuration that said the field was available, or an action was available, or a field was um, active as well. There is multiple dialogue. So this is where you can combine dialogues together so that the user can click where they expect to click. Um, best way to illustrate this is um, a number of patterns, but you see this is what I call a starter pattern, where you may have a construct and an input statement before you do a report or an inquiry or a batch process. And um, with your initial generic transformation, you would find that you could only click 
in the input or you could only click in the construct and you had all sorts of code to navigate between the two. Using multiple dialog enables you to combine those two statements together so that the user can click anywhere on the form and the user is in both the input and the construct at the same time. And there are a number of different patterns where you'll see this new code. So um, I call it the starter pattern with construct and input, but you'll also see it with um, import and input array for entering master detail type patterns and using two display arrays to drag to drag from left to right or from one to the other. So two lists, the two list pattern we can drag between the two. Unbuffered. Switching to unbuffered can reduce your lines of code. So where you might have had let field equals value, display by name field, this now becomes let field equal value. You don't need to explicitly put in those displays. By using unbuffered mode, program variables and form variables are automatically synchronized. We also have the concept of centralizing actions via the on actions syntax. So this is where you re replace various lots of key syntax with on action. So on key F5 becomes on action zoom. You use action defaults or the 4A default to centralize your action definitions. And then you have various means to trigger actions. So not just buttons, but click it or clicking on images. But you've also got things like top menus and toolbars where you can trigger actions. By using on action instead of these um, key syntax, your code does not need to change if you decide to trigger the action in a different manner. So what we what I encourage you to do is to take it, take all that all those GUI options into account, and you create a document called a style guide. This contains coding standards, definitions of coding standards of what is acceptable GUI code for your system. Ideally, you centralize where possible via presentation styles and universal rendering customization. So you document that in your style guide, and then you transform your sources to adhere to the style guide. So in transforming to GUI, this is what I suggest your first steps are. See if you can run in traditional mode using the Gennaro desktop client. And then run in GUI graphical rendering mode with the Gennaro desktop client. Take a form and change it from string to layout and review your, and then experiment and review for the available syntax and options. Create a style guide document that documents how you want your GUI application to look, and then transform your sources to meet your new style guide. If you're in a fortunate position where a slow rollout is possible, then use the um, traditional mode to enable you to work on the important programs at the beginning and do the less important programs as time fits. I'll figure out how to show some GUI programs, but what I'm quickly going to do is just using our demo the demo program. I've started a number of demo programs up. And so they're just showing some of the things you can do. So um, this is our infamous water and trucks demo. So drag and drop from one side to the other. And it's also got multiple dialogues in effect because both two display arrays happen at the same time. Another example with multiple dialogues. Here I've got an edit, an input at the top, and there's a combo box actually. So the combo box, checkbox, button edit, etc. Um, but yeah, I can sit between the display array and the input at the top because it's in multiple dialogue and they're both active at the same time. Things like the aggregates, so we can um, have totals calculated automatically. So you see at the bottom the numbers are going up automatically. Completer, so typing away into a field and the list is um, being generated as you type. type thing. In the demo program, there's demos for all the different widgets. So um, something like in a combo box, you can see there this type of thing that's become available. Um, SVG basics, so putting an area of screen there and being able to put lots of different types of widgets. And not, well, not even widgets, so in an SVG canvas, draw what you want inside the box. Um, and then recently, we've done things with, such as responsiveness. So here we've got a table. But that will change its appearance as you make the field, as you make the browser smaller. 
similarly, you can do things such as controlling whether things stretch or not. So notice some of those columns stay the same, while other columns stretch. And our table, so the display arrays, nice and good being shown how you can display in a display array and then you can do things in there like um, sorting. Have I got anything useful to sort there? Probably not because it's all um, generated um, randomly, but um, perhaps doing things such as creating columns around and trying to resort on them, etc. So um, within the demos, within the user interface, there are a lot of programs in there that you can use to show different um, um, GUI features. And I'm not going to do justice within three minutes, five minutes. Um, that's something for you to encourage, but you know, it's, it is quite amazing to get people to think and say, hey, is that an Intermix 4 GL program? Yes, it is. It's two display arrays being executed at the same time with the extra options to enable you to respond as you drag elements across, extra actions to respond as you drag across. Now, I haven't mentioned everything with the, in the Gennaro product suite to this point. Um, what I haven't mentioned is probably not something you're going to cover in your first steps. But one of the important ones you might want to incorporate in your first steps, so I've sort of put it in a halfway house, is this concept of generic code. And that enables you to reduce the number of lines of code by using generic code techniques. And a good example of this is FGL underscore Zoom, which I'll demonstrate shortly. But what it means is that rather than transforming lots of repeated code patterns within your code base, you may be able to transform quicker by using generic code techniques. Demo of um, generic code. Example, I like to show the powers of it. So I've got six button edits here, and the question I put to people is: as I click here and display a list of, in the case, states, in this case, countries. Um, customers, etc. The question I pose to them is, how many forms and display arrays do you think are behind those? How many database queries are there? And most people will say, one, two, three, four, five, six, there must be six forms, there must be six display arrays, there must be six database cursors. When the answer is actually one, I've able to code, been able to code this generically. So if I put the cursor up there, the unique source for that, for this particular Zoom window is this. That's all, the co that's all the code I needed to write, to all the new code I needed to write to generate that Zoom window. So if we look at, look at the code, we see there's an SQL statement. So selecting the state name and code from my state program, and then a little bit of definition about each column and against about the Zoom window altogether. So we compare it to country, that's probably a very similar one. Um, resource, different SQL statement, and a little bit different with the column definitions. Whereas some of these other ones, the customer has about six columns, so it's a little bit more going into that definition. But that's what generic code gives you. It enables you to um, make the unique code just what is different or unique about that particular Zoom window. Um, so when it comes to transforming your sources, you may f find that um, if you've got example, you can replace existing code with generic code, or if you've got existing generic code, you can modify that quite easily to um, go forth using Gennaro. So um, that's using the my FGL Zoom example. Jay's Gennaro, yep, that repository there. So um, have a look at that if you can and look at the various um, code that's in there and the techniques I've used to handle that generically. Basically, FGL underscore Zoom, I think got about a thousand lines of code in it. Yep, or just over 1200. So that's um, a common routine that it's able to do all that for you. Okay, so um, other products I've not mentioned, but I'll just mention in passing, 
BAM, or Business Application Modeling. This is our low-code solution. So this is where you design new programs basically by dragging things around on the, on the screen, and this will generate 4GL applications for you. Um, I haven't mentioned Gennaro Mobile, GMI or GMA. Basically what that's doing is bundling a runtime and front-end and your Gennaro application all together to create an app on a mobile device. We have GGC, or our Gennaro Ghost Client. This is our testing tool. This is where you run a program and generate a test program from its log, then you modify your test program as appropriate, and then run your test program repeatedly. So you put it into scripts or whatever to run at night that verify that your program still runs correctly, that no one's broken it during the day. Within Gennaro Studio, we have a new thing called GSLint, which is a tool that you can use to enforce code quality. What I also haven't mentioned, FLM, 4JS License Manager. That's a tool you can use to help manage our licenses better. GIP, Gennaro Identity Provider. Um, JGAS, Gennaro Application Server for Java. And GAR, Gennaro Archive and Deployment. These are all things that um, you may see in the documentation, but they're probably not going to be part of your initial Gennaro transformations. So I've been going for over an hour, so it's probably time to wrap up. Um, so a bit of a summary, lots of resources available to you, documentation, developer forums, um, our training on our website, which includes some self, new self-paced training initiatives. You've got my Ask Ruben blog, and you can go back and look at our past um, worldwide developer conferences via this easy to remember URL, 4Js.com slash WWDC. You have the test drive. So this is a, where you can go onto our website and download Gennaro for 30 days. Download Gennaro Studio and the products. This enables you to compile and run Gennaro applications locally on your PC. Or if you want to run things on your existing development server, you can ask for a, contact um, one of our salespeople and ask for an evaluation or time bond license, which enables you to compile and run on your development server. Also in the resources available to you, our local support offices. And if you need additional resources, so this is where you perhaps start to pay for additional developers, then we've also got our professional services. So if you need more resources than what you have in-house, then um, we can provide those as well. So yeah, in summary, in 20 years, and hopefully I've set that off enough, we've added a lot of functionality. So first step, get your existing 4GL running using our product. Second step, Evaluate where you can use your existing application and development. We can improve your application and you can improve your development environment. Third step, focus on an area and improve on that using one of our products. Um, and then repeat the third step with different 4Js products. Continuously evolve your application. We're always adding new functionality, so you should always look to um, continuously evolve your application to incorporate that new functionality. And yeah, just work closely with 4Js people. And um, if you do require extra resources, then um, professional services available there as well. So thank you.